I want to welcome the three of you to UBA today. Uh, we have guests with us from across the pond from Great Britain. We have Shannon Hopkins, who is no stranger to Texas. Shannon has uh, lived in Texas. Is a native of Texas? Mm, kind of. Born in Alabama. Born but in Alabama. But then a Texas parent. Came so. to Texas as soon as you she, could. Absolutely. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and she is currently serving as a pioneer missionary in London. We have Rachel Jordan with the Church of England. Rachel, tell us a bit about what you do with the Church of England. Um, I'm the National Mission and Evangelism Advisor, and I guess in many ways my job is to encourage mission and evangelism across our church in all different ways. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you. And we have Catherine Pearson. And Catherine, tell us a bit of what you do. Um, I work part-time for Mishishka House, and I work part-time as a project manager for um, charities and uh, government projects. Great. And I'm going to be asking you to share a little bit more in detail about all of those things in a few moments as we get talking. But first, as we often hear, the church in the United States is kind of following in the pathway of the church in Europe and Great Britain, which of course has a much longer and, and deeper history. And as the three of you have been serving there, I would like for you to share with us some of the comparisons or contrasts that you see. What, how do you see the U.S. church following in that pathway or not? Hmm. It's a fantastic question. Um, it's interesting because, you know, this morning I was talking to Karen Campbell and she said, you know, seven years ago um, when you were here, it was all, you know, the church is on decline and, you know, we really need mission, a new mission in Europe and you know, and that's the way, and we told that story a lot, and that's the way America is becoming. It's more and more secular, post-Christian, and that's true, but yet there's still a vibrant core to the church that's, you know, I think this, that's a similarity right now, that the church in England is really looking at culture and saying, how do we engage it? Mm -hmm. And I um, and I find that really um, inspiring and encouraging right now, that they're saying, okay, how do we pioneer in culture and be do mission to our own culture and context. Um, and I think they're looking at their own context and saying, we've got to do it differently. I think that is a difference because I think still here we're saying, yes, we need to do mission, but I think we're not innovating quite as fast in America. We're, we're trying and we're looking, but I think we still say, okay, we've got, we've still got a bigger church population, so it's not as much a need. If that so makes you're sense. actually seeing maybe still a little bit more lingering in the more traditional approaches in the yes. U.S. than venturing out into the yeah. pioneering and, and fresh encounters maybe that will be yeah. fresh expressions. expressions that we'll be looking at yeah. in a few moments. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's it. I mean, I'm, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking today. Rachel, yeah. Catherine, what about you? What are your impressions about that? Um, I think that, I think that's probably true. I think, um, Knowing some people from from my generation, from the time I became a Christian when I was a teenager, that um, the church uh, doesn't have a great um, people don't have uh, a huge respect for it for many mm -hmm. many reasons, mm -hmm. and so it's difficult to engage people if you say come to church with me or come and find out about this at my church. So it's very much about looking at different ways that you can talk to people about um, faith and about you know, your relationship with Jesus and that kind of thing, as opposed, not in a church setting, because mm -hmm. that puts up lots of barriers. So there are, there is just ways that we have to take away those barriers to get right to the, the crux of what it is that we are trying to do. This might be a good moment for you to just share a bit about how you see people encountering God in Great Britain. What, what are you seeing developing there as people begin to look for God or not? Yeah. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest areas that people uh, encounter God is through the arts, the arts movement. Um, it's one of the things that um, the secularists don't really don't really touch. It's like okay if you're a bit arty to talk about God and spirituality. Um, it's not okay if you're in government or you're trying to get some political message across. You kind of mm -hmm. you know sometimes you persuaded to keep religion out of it. But in that kind of sector, so in film and in, um, in drama and song and that kind of thing, that's where people can express and, and, and talk about 
God and spirituality and, and their journeys. Interesting. We have some churches that have a very strong approach mm. of the arts, of music, mm. of using artists, and so we're seeing some of that here in, in Houston yeah. that we hope is going to develop mm, more, that's good. especially Great. in, in the think, area. I think in other ways, I think people are really act. I think people of faith are very active in all parts of society. That's what I find more. I used to say that if somebody said they're a Christian in Britain, they're really serious about their faith. And so they're looking at areas of injustice and saying, how do we stand up and engage with that? And they're... I mean, that's, mm, and that that's really true. struck me at the beginning, whereas in America, the assumption is you're Christian first, mm -hmm. or you have some kind of Christian background, your family was Christian, and that's changing, you know, over time as society becomes more secular, but that that's a huge difference, and with that, you see people engaging, so even with the Occupy movement, people asking mm -hmm. questions about how does that connect, you know, really with our faith, how do Christians engage with that? I just I think we've probably faced um, issues faster than you because so our decline happened I don't I, so I don't know your figures so mm -hmm. I can only really work on and I'm not as very experienced if you like in an American mm -hmm. context it's my first trip <laughs> um, so I that that's that's harder for me to do that comparative work but I think we face decline much f um, faster and steeper than you so we're probably we might be if you like um, be able to show what might be coming next because we've actually faced a kind much sharper so our um, even our generation profiles and um, their experiences we we are we've shot off the scale on people just not being churched or not understanding what church is or not knowing who jesus is mm -hmm. so things are in in the younger end of the spectrum in our society in britain you can have no assumption that people would know anything at all mm -hmm. you shouldn't start with that assumption you should start with almost a blank canvas and that's an opportunity as well, in some and ways, it's almost yeah. a, it's a huge challenge, but it's also in some ways an opportunity because people aren't carrying the baggage yeah. right. of I oh I tried that once and didn't really like it. Mm -hmm. So because they just never, they didn't even try, they they just have a lot of less knowledge. Yeah. And that to us is a a lot of it's to do if you do age profiling on on our churches and church experience. Um, so our decline just happened faster. Mm. Well, and one of the things we hope to do today is learn something um, that will assist us here in the United States that we can learn from you and apply and um, help our churches to revitalize, to become more engaged in social justice issues, to, um, to be transformed. We, we actually yeah. use the word transformation a lot. We use the word transformation in our vision statement and one of the things that Shannon has been doing is working on a transformation mm -hmm. index. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that and um, take some time to go in depth for us. We're going to want to okay. explore that a little bit now. So it's the transformational index and it is a tool about to measure impact and really looking at qualitative impact. And it really came out of some of it came out of experience. So you'll know that we did the campaign The Truth Isn't Sexy. Mm -hmm. Well, the Truth Isn't Sexy was hugely powerful in some ways. You know, we did a campaign at four out of ten men that saw the campaign in pubs and clubs that changed their opinion of paid sexual services. Say, say just a bit about what that was in case okay. people don't remember. So The Truth Isn't Sexy was a campaign ad to address the demand side of human trafficking, and it was done on beer, beer mats or coasters. I still have some in my oh. office. Oh. Coasters, yes. <laughs> So coasters and posters, and we distributed them through pub crawls in the UK, and we did a parliamentary launch to really lobby government, and we set the UK standard for addressing demand, and then it's been under review with um, the EU. Excellent. So, and we did that, and so four out of ten men saw the campaign in pubs and clubs that changed their opinion of paid sexual services. One out of four became influencers of their peers. Um, we had 6,000 people involved in the campaign, 33 small groups across the country, 80 calls to the hotline that led to brothels being busted. And that sounds really powerful, and, it, and to some extent it was. Mm -hmm. We did the campaign, though, on 5,000 pounds, less than $10,000. At the end of three years, we had a core team that said, we can't take this any further. We gave the learning away, and 
the next time I was back in the in the U.S., people kept going, oh, but what's happening with it now? And, oh, is that a failure because it's not continuing? And we were saying, well, it got on the national agenda. It changed the conversation in the media. Right. How much more power can you get? Mm -hmm. And I also saw this huge drop in funding. My funding dropped 50% after that campaign and hasn't recovered. And so I was like, what's going on here? How do you, how do you explain that kind of impact? Because we weren't measuring salvations, we weren't measuring baptisms, right. we weren't measuring churches planted. It doesn't look like impact. So it's like, we're not speaking the same language. So how do we begin to really look at impact and measuring that kind of transformation that took place? And we started with language. We said, okay, we think it is linguistic. The, the issue is linguistic in nature. So we started with language. We worked with a small group and an extended group. So a small team at the very core working on the project. So Andy Schofield, who um, was actually a linguist. I mean, that's his background from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And he works with us at Matryoshka House. Um, and then Brad Sargent out of San Francisco. And I kind of spearheaded that. And then we worked with people that were doing social enterprise, impact investing. Um, nonprofit work, church planting, everything across the board, and got their in, influ and their input. Input. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> we got their input on it, and through a series of events, we've kind of narrowed it down. We have 52 indicators, and then we basically mm -hmm. it works like a game. We take a team through using it. I don't know if you'd use that word. <laughs> it feels like a game to me. We try to make it fun, interactive, and get you down to like, what are the top five to seven things to help you measure qualitative impact? So are they doing fill in the blank? Are they doing put the little index cards up on the wall and sort right, of so take them down? You get a stack or, of cards, uh -huh. like a deck of cards, and they all have words on them. And you have 10 minutes to go through and discard any that just you're not doing that, you're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Where's your mm -hmm. impact from? Then you narrow, and you keep narrowing, keep narrowing, keep narrowing. Are these pre-printed cards pre that you said? Pre-printed cards, they're okay. pre-printed mm -hmm. cards. Mm -hmm. And the idea, it's a little bit based on strength finders. I don't, do you know strength finders? I know Buckingham, go find your strengths, but. Okay, so. Um, so yes. it may not be the same. Okay, Should, so tell strength, us what that so is. So strength finders get you to get your five strengths, and it mm -hmm. says, for so long, management tools had you look at where you were weak and kind of shore up some of your weaknesses. This is kind of the Buckingham principle. Yeah, yeah so I'm familiar with that. So focus on your mm -hmm. strengths. And we, we've that. It's, okay, so let's get to the five to seven that are really crucial. So like in the hostel, we use entrustment as one of our measures with the design camps. It's a bigger, it's a little stronger than empowerment. And I should actually tell, mm -hmm. know exactly how we define that. But like we entrust the women. So we're beginning to see the women become leaders. And that's a sign. And as that happens, that's one of our measurements for impact and for success. And so, it's the change in the women, how they view themselves, how they're able to then lead yes. and respond to, and interact yes. with and others. And they can yeah. take on that leadership. And that becomes the evidence for measuring that, in, that indis, indices that we're looking at, indicator. Mm -hmm. Um, is entrustment. We want to see that happen, and we believe that it's happened, and so we look for the evidence of it. And so as you see their work. behaviors change, mm -hmm. you can see right. that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good. So, uh, yeah. So, well, no, I was, I was going to say that um, the, the tool uh, is really helpful for every stage of, a, of an organization or a project, that you can use it in the beginning to um, try and define your objectives for what you're trying to achieve in the beginning, you can measure your progress against those, but equally you can apply something, you can apply it to the end of a, pro, um, a project or a process to see what you have actually done. Because one of the things that we often find with projects and programs is that we may have had a number of objectives that we've achieved, but we've also got these um, kind of um, byproduct, which it sounds like it's a wasteful thing, but actually it's byproduct things that have happened, which, mm -hmm. which are brilliant. It might even be better, right. like some of the relationships that are built up right. and the, or the spin-off right. projects or the, mm -hmm. the, um, the inspiration that's mm -hmm. come from a program that you never really built into mm -hmm. your objectives originally. We never build in that we're all going to yeah. become great friends and we're going to 
um, you know, create a community <laughs> around this right. and we're going to see 10 more projects come off the back of it. You don't really talk about that at the beginning, but you've got something at the end that mm. you, you use this tool and it helps you identify mm. that you've done that. And that is actually quite transformational and, and it has a, a huge impact mm. on all the people that have been in part. So that's kind mm. of... So you yeah. were using this with the women in well, the Torch so, so we have used it internally. Mm -hmm. We've started using it on all of our projects. Um, there's a new project that's launched at the Marlboro Project that's using it. But we, we're piloting it. So we have an impact investment firm that's using it. So there's a... There's a new fund for social entrepreneurship and social enterprises, 400 million pounds, and uh, there's an impact investment firm that is in charge of giving away a quarter of that. Well, anybody that applies for that pot of money has to go through the transformational index. It's their mm -hmm. preferred measuring tool. So this is specifically not something that's just limited to the church life. No. And so how are you using it in the church then at well, this point? So church, CMS has used it, and they're using CMS? the Church Mission Society. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay. um, to a lot of I, I learned that Alphabet here though. <laughs> yes. Um, so CMS Church Mission Society has used it. Now they have just launched a training program to train pioneers in mission, and. Pioneer ordination candidates, that's how you said. And they're using the transformational index as their measuring tool for that project. So we went through it at the beginning with them before they launched to set the help set the objectives and then they they're using it on an annual basis. I think it's probably worth noting that um the way that we identified the indicators was also to look at what we believed transformation to be mm -hmm. and what are the indicators mm -hmm. of transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a long title, mm -hmm. but also looking at where we saw evidence of that in the Bible and and um, and how we can use those. So each one of our indicators uh, is evidenced, you know, through um, through Scripture, so that we can then see, you know, where God is at work in the church, but also in the secular. Because I guess that's you know what we believe where there's um, activities of social justice. That's obviously sure. something that God's interested in. So we have ways of seeing, you know, what God's doing in the church and also outside of the church by using this tool. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So you have 52 indicators? Yes. So give us some idea of what those are. Well, so entrustment is one. Right. Empowerment's another. Um, collaboration. Collaboration. Participation. Engagement. Integrity. Yes. Um, investment. Yeah. Um, um, you can tell it's been a long time now since <laughs> you looked at them. Oh, constructive disruption, which is what when well, we say, say more about, about that. The, what what, that. Well, that's really a truth mm -hmm. isn't sexy indicator that we really just you know constructively disrupted the conversation and cha to bring about change. Change perspectives, change paradigms. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so how would these apply in a church? You go into a church mm. and you say, we want to um, engage you with the transformation index. Yeah. Tell me then what's going to happen. Well, we, it, we can do things in a series of ways. So right now we're doing a lot of bespoke consultancy. So we can meet with the staff and help them go through it. One thing it does is it helps you articulate your theory of change as you begin to narrow down your indicators so I think it helps a church really look at discipleship beyond a program mm. to how is that the thing we begin measuring instead of church attendance? How do we measure the fruits of discipleship? So moving away mm. from the traditional numbers of how many mm. people were baptized, how many people are mm. showing up for worship, yes. Yes. into more uh, behavioral mm -hmm. things that yes. grow out of a transformation. Yes. Yeah. And how do you yes. quantify the the qualitative aspects of yeah. that. How do you so, how do you measure that someone has become more generous since engaging in a relationship with God? How do you measure that a, a, um, a relationship, a marriage, has got stronger? You know, we don't talk about that very easily in churches. Um, so it, it is. It's, it's one of the things Karen says is it's um, quantifying the qualitative. Yes. yes. So all of those stories, all of those case studies. Um, it's a way of, of going through that. So those indicators, those words, should start to describe some of those things that you want to see. 
and they can be very relational or they could be very um, active. There could be a lot, a lot around action or they could be relational, mm -hmm. uh, relation, relational or they could be a hybrid of, mm -hmm. of a mix. Because there's so many, um, each church will probably pick different, different ones. And we say it's yeah. a bit like a personality test for an organisation. Yeah. Well, and so are they picking what they see or what they hope to see? Well, you have to... Okay, either. A better, either. Well, a good example, though, is with Sweet Notions. When we did the Sweet Notions, um, we TI'd Sweet Notions in the beginning, and Sweet Notions is a social enterprise that we run. Um, I put one out, and it was so idealistic. And I can't even remember what it was, but everyone at the table went back and was like, whoa, Shannon, we want to do that, but there's no way we're doing that. You know, so you have that mm -hmm. challenge that happens in a team, too, that says, maybe that's the thing we need to be doing, but if, so let's get it on the table and let's really start measuring that. How are we going to do that? So you have this so tension. tension. There's a, mm -hmm. Yes, and it really okay. does. I mean, I know... Um, you guys talk a lot about creative tension at EBA. Mm -hmm. It really is a product, a tool that that really mm -hmm. ha creates creative tension for whoever's using it. So yeah. hopefully every church would be able to identify some of these 52. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's great. We're absolutely doing yeah. that. We're doing a really good job at this one yes. thing or these two things yes. or whatever it is. And then out of those, they would also perhaps identify these are mm -hmm. weaker or Yes. Well, if it's identifying or, strengths, or, you're not looking yeah, for them to me, identify non-existent no, things, but, right? Uh, no. I it wouldn't be non-existent. If right. you have the right people in the group doing it, what you'll probably find is that you'll have some realists and you'll have some people with the visions. And then, so the people who are often more visionary will say, well, we're doing this, we're doing this. And then the realists will say, no, that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. not quite doing it yet mm -hmm. and they'll pick out ones that they mm -hmm. you, they know that they are doing and they mm -hmm. can think of the evidence to support that and so then it creates a conversation so you go from 52 to 24 to you know and, and you reduce right. down and you do it as a group and you do it collaboratively mm -hmm. and you talk about it and it it really can flush out some of the mm -hmm. yeah some of the um, areas that you want to concentrate mm -hmm. on or or what have you, maybe even mm -hmm. some of those byproducts that you didn't realize you were right. um, actually yeah. achieving. So they and get a better picture of who they, they are. Yes. yes, and then yeah. they look, they find better ways to measure that so, yes. that so that instead of filling out a form, this many people came on Sunday, this many people are going through this course, and all these number bases, mm -hmm. they begin saying, okay, these are the things we want to look for now. And, how, and this is how we're going to capture that. And it also, I think it, it starts creating more stories. You know, we can be really good at telling, you know, one story over and over. And I can be guilty of that, too. I can tell the truth isn't sexy and the sweet notion story. And, um, you know, but it, I think it helps you create more stories as well. That, look, God is at work in this. And... Isn't this exciting? And actually, one of the indicators is storytelling, mm -hmm. because we, you know, that was one of the things we really acknowledged that that's what Jesus did. He didn't really mm -hmm. talk about numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't. That wasn't really what he was interested in. It was more about individuals and, mm -hmm. and how they developed and um, using stories mm -hmm. to do that. So. And does the process for the transformation index then have a a process for helping the church learn to do this better? For instance, if it's storytelling, mm -hmm. then is there a training aspect or the facilita what else? The facilitation does help you do that. And we're beginning to work. I mean, one thing we want to do is more peer-to-peer -peer delivery of the, of the tool as well. But the facilitation really pulls out, okay, well, are you doing that? How are you doing that? How can you do that better? So I think that would be my hmm. answer to that. Yeah, I, I think maybe that's... I think maybe at the moment that's as far as the tool goes, yeah. and then it's um, I mean, sort of yeah, up we to the organisation to then move that forward, move and, forward. and find yeah. other people to, to provide the expertise mm -hmm. in that particular niche. Because um, mm -hmm. it might be like a new IT system that you'd need, and well, we wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or a new <laughs> website <laughs> to communicate, right. or right. rebranding, or um, you know, just other yeah. ways of measuring. And you know, we you know we can we can make recommendations, but. I mean, yeah. and, and it is a tool, it's usable, it's being used. We say we're in the piloting phase, mm -hmm. but it is still in development. I mean, we're still refining it, we're still testing it. 
we've got a lot of things we want to do with it. You know, if we want to build a website that can help share the data because, mm. well, what if a church in America, in, in Houston, is doing something really similar to a church in London? Well, and they pick the same indicator. Shouldn't they share how they're measuring that? You know, or a hostel, you know. So a website development York, that would that help, help yeah. communication. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you share a moment about, briefly, about um, the journey to get here? Well, like I said, you know, it really was post The Truth Isn't Sexy, and while we were starting Sweet Notions, mm -hmm. um, Andy and I began chatting all the time about why. Why aren't people getting the impact to what we're doing into our projects in the church? And yet we're getting traction, we're engaging volunteers, like what's, what's missing? So we began kind of dreaming and scheming about this project. And then McClellan Foundation out of Tennessee, their European strategy advisor was in London, and we went to dinner, and it was next to this shop called Monocle. Anyway, I, I'm just going on. I'm just telling you the real story. That's what I want. You're yeah. going to edit it. Yeah. We went to dinner, and it was next to the Monocle shop, and Monocle is like one of my favorite magazines, and it's just so well published, and it's on global design and politics and, you know, cultural affairs. Mm -hmm. And we went in, and they had this poster on the happiness index. You know, 50 things to know to make your life happier. And it was mm -hmm. cheesy. It was like so, but it was so cool. It was, you know, add an extra month to the calendar or, you know, 36-hour days. and You know, all these, you know, different things. And I was Just like, that's things, what we yeah. need. That's what we need is something like that to describe the indicator. And Lee turned to me and he said, oh, Shannon, that's something we could finally fund that you do. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> All right. A serendipitous <laughs> moment. <laughs> because they are historically evangelism, church planting, stewardship, and but they do a research piece. Uh -huh. And he said, we realize as a foundation that there's a gap between the people that fund and the people on the ground doing mission. And the mission people will just, they'll say whatever you want to say to get the money. And, you know, and then the funders end, end up, they fund, but then they get frustrated because the results don't match what they think they were going to. Right. And so this disconnect, and there's not a good way to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so they gave an initial grant for us to explore the process, and we began working and looking at how do we start, that's where we began with the language assumption. And that took us about 18 months to go through, begin having the conversations, mm -hmm. meeting experts. We ended up meeting with somebody at The Economist that also said, you know, for nonprofits um, and the charity sector, measurement's going to be the big issue of the next 20 years. And kind of agreed with us, and we talked about, do you think language is a good place to begin? So, we, you know, I mean, that was very cool, sitting in the economist's office with Matthew Bishop. In New York. In New York. In New York. And um, so that, that was the initial phase. And then we got, we got a second grant, so that's helped us to really kind of put the tool together. And then we had a gathering in September that Karen came over for, and we had 24 people there. Um, and we basically let them road test it and tear it apart. We basically said, we may have gotten this all wrong. Mm -hmm. So we need Terrifying you. Terrifying thought. It is. Um, <laughs> Andy didn't like it when I said, you know, kept saying, we may have to tear it all up. You <laughs> <laughs> really didn't, didn't like that. that. No, no. <laughs> we do not want to do that. <laughs> so, um, but, so we went in and we let them road test it. And it was, and it, and again, it was with Christian groups, non-Christian groups. It was with big groups and small groups with, with investors and the overwhelming feedback was yep this works and we need this get it out there and that's our challenge now is we we've got a lot of opportunities we're very limited on funds and what's the strategic way to launch the transformational index and take it public well that was my next question was what do you hope here what's your next step here what mm -hmm. do you hope for the next step in the future here um we really want to be back in May or June and do a series of workshops and conferences to take it public. Um, we'd like to do that both with Christian groups and with, we'd like to do some just public everybody welcome conferences. And if those so, conferences were to develop, who's involved in that from a church? Is it the leadership um, team? Is it a group of only the pastoral team? Is it 20 people from the church? Um, I, what do you really, envision for that? 
Um, I think what would be really amazing and from a church perspective, like if we did something in Houston, is open it up to all the staffs of all the church and ask them to bring two to three people that aren't in core leadership their church bring them with them mm. to, so to three to take. six to ten max yeah, people 10 max. from the church yeah. and come in and do small and let everyone go through the tool and do it do a cons, do our consultancy piece for that and then share the results and then you've got people that can begin delivering the tool also to other organizations in the city the ymca or um you know other any nonprofit. you know okay so the the transformation index is a tool that helps Churches, organizations, secular, commercial, or nonprofit and religious to yeah. measure their impact by yes. using language yes. that helps them identify indicators of transformation and come to agreement on those yes. and then communicate those to other people. Yes. Excellent. Excellent.